Imagine your grandparents owned a small cottage on the shores of Loch Lomond, just south of the Scottish Highlands. Perhaps they purchased their cottage from friends in the 1970s, who had themselves purchased it several generations previously, a, a, a large home and several cottages from an even larger estate in the 1870s. When that estate was originally divided, it wouldn't have been uncommon for the estate owner to require that the property was never used as a tannery, given the smell. Similarly, when it was sold to your grandparents, there may have been the additional consideration that it would never be used as a manufacturing facility, given the noise. In Scotland, each of these transactions would have been recorded as a sequence of legal land deeds. Now, imagine that you had a hundred million of these deeds that together combined to describe the current ownership, rights and responsibilities of all the land in Scotland. How would you go about storing, searching and providing access to these deeds? Finally, imagine that you had to do all of this, but without computers, without photocopiers, without typewriters. In fact, to start, all you have is ink and a whole lot of paper. That's the problem domain of Registers of Scotland, or ROS, who develop and maintain the world's oldest land register. ROS's technical approach to solving this problem over the last 400 years is a fascinating story with pre-echoes of many modern computing concepts like hashing, link lists, and search trees, but backported to their paper versions. I'm Keith Robertson, working with ROS on the architecture for this effort. I'm Charlie Batchelor, Senior Consultant with AWS Professional Services. Through this session, Keith and I will discuss the approach that ROS took to migrate its invaluable deeds to the serverless cloud. And if you need to make or encourage the adoption of a single mechanism to store and make available critical documents inside of an organization with strong governance, then this is the talk for you. We've broken the session into three key parts. Firstly, Keith will give some background and history about the deeds and why they're so critical. I'll give a technical overview of how ROS replaced their many bespoke archival devices with a single, more secure and durable serverless one. Secondly, we'll discuss how ROS met its strong public sector governance requirements, making use of AWS services to improve their operational capabilities in deployment, monitoring and backup. Finally, we'll discuss how ROS encouraged the adoption of the archive, allowing other registers to benefit from it quickly, while delivering some unforeseen benefits that allowed ROS to respond faster to COVID and accelerate its registration processes. We'll wrap up the sessions with some key takeaways we've both learned along ROS's journey to the cloud. Let's begin by telling a bit more of the story of ROS. ROS maintained 20 public registers, covering many aspects of people, property, and documents. The most well-known are the two main property registers. First up is the General Register of Sazines, which dates to 1617 and is still active today. In Sazines, changes are recorded by the addition of a new deed, which in turn references trees of previous deeds. If a further deed updated your grandparents' cottage, for instance referencing the restrictions against manufacturing here, or the tanneries here. The land register was introduced in 1981 and it's incrementally absorbing Sazines. Changes are still submitted through deeds, but the information in that tree of deeds, including the restrictions, are used to create a single registered title for a specific property. From a tech perspective, it's quite like a flattened Sazines. Originally, clerks would hand copy the deed into the yearly record volume. And this was a chronological ordering of the deeds for each historic Scottish county. Thankfully, you didn't need to read through the entire record volume as minute books were also kept. And these were semi-structured summaries of deeds that would point back to the book and page with the full deeds text. Interestingly, the minute and the date and the county together were effectively a unique hash and allowed for basic indexing. In the 1870s, search sheets were introduced making it easier to locate deeds against a property. Deeds would be summarized on the search sheet and again point back to the full deed in the record volume. They also allowed you to quickly ascertain details like the previous and current owner, the amounts paid, and the mortgages taken and discharged. As larger properties were split, new search sheets would be introduced, linking the parent to the child and the child to the parent, essentially a paper double-link list. Still, it wasn't easy to find all the search sheets 
So a further index listing all of the transactions against streets or, or wider areas and mapping that to the individual search sheet was created. All of this was compiled manually, originally handwritten and from the 20th century to a typewritten. It comprises a complete and remarkably searchable history of Scotland's land. As computing was introduced, deeds were imaged in tranches and are now stored in a variety of different devices. Summary minutes were also digitized, converted to text, and are now searchable. However, the full deed image remains essential. It is the legal document and the only source of the complete legal text. And it's the thing that provides certainty of land ownership. Ra's desire to retire the aging devices and standardize on a single approach to archiving deeds and other artifacts. But the governance requirements were significant. Extreme durability, indefinite retention, highest security. So Ross began discussions with AWS Professional Services to collaborate on a solution that we'd like to share with you today. This slide contains the architecture used for the Archive API and Serverless Archive Viewer application. It may look like a simple architecture, but what I want to show you is how Ross technically met their strong governance requirements by the way these services are connected to each other. If we go back to our property on the shores of Loch Lomond, after many years they've managed to sell off and pay off their mortgage and would like to officially discharge the mortgage against the property. Their lawyer would submit the change to the register of seasons using the digital submission portal. The seasons application looks up the archive service API using Amazon Route 53. The deed is then passed from the application to Amazon API Gateway, which invokes AWS Lambda to upload a new copy of the deed. For an employee in ROS, to then view that deed, they use the serverless archive viewer. They would browse the application URL in their browser, which is resolved by Route 53 and directs them to an Amazon CloudFront distribution, which delivers the website. Once loaded, the application requests the user to log on and when authenticated, the API is passed the query, which retrieves the deed to be returned to the browser. I'm now going to go into some more depth about how these services interact and why they were chosen. One of Ross's key requirements was for a durable and secure object storage solution to store the deeds. Amazon S3 fits Ross's requirements well with 11.9's durability. But what does that mean from Ross's perspective? With 100 million deeds, they would expect to lose one every thousand years. The S3 service is resilient by design with data stored redundantly across availability zones within the region the objects are stored. For moving the data in and out of S3, two lambdas are used, one for uploading and one for fetching documents. Instead of the lambda execution role itself having access to the S3 buckets, the, the lambda function itself takes an environmental variable from the requesting application and uses this variable to define the role used to access the S3 document collection. From a security perspective, this means applications can only access documents they have permissions to, which is defined within the IAM role policy. This avoids any other consuming services having the ability to read or write documents outside their own pro uh, product domain. When the originating application, for example, registers of Seasons app, requests the document via API Gateway, access is managed by a resource policy, an AWS WAF, called Web Application Firewall. The resource policy controls the invocation of the API method, which invokes the previously mentioned lambdas. For an application to invoke API Gateway, the resource policy stipulates the API can only be executed by a specific IAM user or role. This gives very granular control over what service can execute against the API Gateway. The WAF is used to validate the content requests by a set of in-house written rule sets, and also works in conjunction with a set of third-party rule sets, which are used to protect against API-style exploits. In summary, to update the property deed in Loch Lomond, we have to satisfy all of the following. The API call has to be from the correct IAM role. The content submission request must satisfy the custom WAF rule set. The application must pass the correct document collection type and object key in the API request, in order to allow the Lambda to retrieve the document from the specified S3 bucket. These components are written in CDK, so when the CloudFormation is created, 
Least privilege access is assigned by default for any policies created between components. From a security perspective, having all these controls adds defense in depth where any requesting any request must follow the service architecture to meet ROS's security and governance needs. The architecture for the document viewer has common backend components where the API gateway can only invoke the get lambda, the get document lambda. This means the app can only fetch documents, it cannot upload them. And instead of the archive viewer API using IAM, it uses Cognito instead. So there must be authentication token present to authorize the API usage. The React single page application is delivered using CloudFront and S3 is used as the origin. CloudFront delivers the content delivery network functionality and HTTPS is added to secure the traffic in transit. A separate WAF is implemented with CloudFront to control the source traffic. This restricts access to only ROS trusted sources being able to access the application. When a user access the viewer, if there's no authentication cookie, they authenticate via Cognito. This validates the user against their internal IDP. When successfully authenticated, a JOT token is issued and used to validate access to the API. This in turn processes the request and validates access to the API. This creates the end request, which is a pre-signed URL to the document being returned to the application and rendered in the browser. Again, we're using the same security approach by adding multiple layering where the data has to flow through the correct stages to be successfully requested. Given the critical nature of the data and applications to Scotland's economy, ROS were keen to understand how teams could leverage even further AWS services to improve their team's capabilities in deployment, monitoring, and backup. ROS product teams are multifunctional. They have all the skills, product, tech, and business to build, own, and run all of the products they're responsible for. ROS plat platform teams, well, they provide and operate the core infrastructure and common patterns used by all or most of the product teams. To allow for team autonomy, but also alignment to common needs, product and platform teams are represented at a consensus-led architectural steering group. And that's collectively, they're responsible to the product and IT leadership. To reduce friction between teams, cross-functional mission teams were introduced with all of the relevant product and platform skills to find solutions to new specific problems and then agree boundaries of any discovered overlaps. To then allow for iterative delivery, but to do so in a way that met with governance requirements, ROS followed a maturity-based approach to risk assessments, where each stage of the, risk of the maturity stage described the platform as safe for pilot development, and then safe for general development, safe for pilot production, and safe for general production. This allowed the cloud platform to develop core functionality early, things like connectivity, security guardrails, and audit logging, but then work with the pilot mission teams to agree patterns for deployment pipelines, monitoring and backup that we'll talk about now. As a pilot team was one of the, uh, was the archive product and it commenced early. So it was able to go live with the register of Sazian deeds in advance of other teams. So once safe for general production, new document types from other teams could quickly build on the risk assessment for the archive, which in turn, Quick would build on the risk assessment for the underlying cloud platform. The ROS product teams are managing all their deployments via code. This includes both the infrastructure and application components. Another key ROS objective was to secure the production account where the live application and data resides. Adopting a multi-account strategy creates a natural security boundary which services can operate within and reduces the blast radius in event of any compromises. The route to live uses the following path. Currently, ROS's Git repository is on premise, so they built a webhook that synchronized their commits plus history to AWS code commit. AWS code pipeline starts the deployment process based on the recognition of that code change. The product teams are writing their applications in CDK. The rationale for this was to be able to standardize code to TypeScript, as well as benefit from the code automation that CDK brings. Code pipeline initiates AWS code build, which does a CDK synth to output the cloud formation code to an S3 bucket. This S3 bucket has been granted read permissions from the cross account role in the production account and allows for a single pipeline to be used and managed from a single account. Code pipeline then deploys the code to the target accounts. 
By using this model, a break glass account, a break glass production account is created where no users are permitted access unless they change a range a change request or have just in time access should they need access into the account. The applications are broken down into multiple pipelines where components are separated based on their life cycle. This can be seen by the way the document service, web application, storage and monitoring are grouped. This effectively reduces redeployment of the collection storage component as you'd expect very few changes after it's initially deployed. Whereas the document service may go through several iterations a week as they release bug fixes or additional features. With the application now deployed, the product teams need to be able to monitor to operate effectively. There's a combination of monitoring tools that are used within ROS. In the product accounts, AWS X-Ray is used to provide end-to-end -end views of requests as they pass through the application. CloudWatch Logs is also used to monitor Lambda and API gateway activities. The product teams have tied their CloudWatch Logs into AWS Chatbot. This gives them real-time notifications via instant messenger. It really is a far superior way than using email because events happen in real time and therefore so should your notifications. Product teams had a history with Elasticsearch, so the platform team took it upon themselves to build an Amazon Elasticsearch as a centralized offering and an analytics account. This can be consumed by multiple product teams. Different log types are being ingested into Amazon Elasticsearch, for example, CloudFront, CloudTrail, CloudWatch logs, and API Gateway, to name a few. So different ingestion patterns have been created with all of the log being stored centrally in S3 and staged there. When a new log drops into the appropriate log bucket, an S3 event fires a Lambda that transforms the data if required and bulk uploads it into Amazon Elasticsearch. Where possible, the logs have been aggregated together using Amazon Kinesis Data Firehose to reduce the number of Lambda upload requests. So we now have an archive service that meets our anticipated requirements. It's durable, secure, scalable, and secure. It supports multi-account automated deployment and continuous monitoring. In other words, we believe it to be resilient. But what do we mean by that? Well, here's a working definition. The ability to provide an agreed level of service in the face of anticipated threats, faults, or other challenges. Charlie's described the improved SLA for durability and availability. He's also described the enhanced security, where access is only via the API and authorized against rules in the corporate identity directory. But what about the unanticipated, the malicious or accidental edit and delete? Well, a similar definition of backup is this. Additional copies of information assets that allow recovery when resilience has failed. Many traditional backup approaches are predicated upon periodic snapshots of the entire archive. Enabling S3 object versioning fundamentally improves in this, and ensuring that accidental edits or soft deletes, well, they're recoverable on a per-object basis. Hard delete is a rare event for ROS, and so it's not exposed by the Archive API, and it's not therefore accessible to staff. But further, enabling MFA delete would ensure that the Archive team itself can't hard delete, even with a rogue code commit. Instead, two people from two different platform teams one with root access to the production account and the other with the authentication device are required together. Both teams know that they should only act after an audible process with executive management sign-off has been completed successfully. Even then, no individual or team would relish the pressure of ensuring that they had correctly coded a permanently destructive delete. So to mitigate against this, one can replicate the entire archive to another account in a different region or if governance prevents that to a separate account in the same region. And V1 replication really helps out here because it propagates soft deletes, but not hard deletes. And this allows for a human time delay because then after an appropriate number of, of uh, hours, days, or weeks, uh, once product and assurance teams are convinced and confident about the change, then the code can be applied to the replica account as well. So in summary, we've discussed how ROS met these strong public sector governance requirements and how ROS leveraged to do this additional AWS services to enhance the capabilities of teams in deployment, monitoring, and backup beyond what was previously possible. Finally, ROS were keen for a single approach to archiving. They wanted to quickly adopt 
uh, the archive across the 20 different registers. But each of these had very unique requirements, stemming from distinct legis legislation, and, and in some cases back to the 1500s. In hindsight, two decisions, one architectural and one service design, really facilitated quick adoption. On the architectural side, part of the reason for many previous archives was each solution had sought to find a common data model for most or perhaps all even of the registers. And this forced register specific concepts into the data model that whilst intended to be generic, inevitably, inevitably weren't. So subsequent projects would come along and recognize that the data model was inappropriate and start the process over. To avoid repeating this mistake, Ross decided that they would only offer a simple key to object capability. And that key would be human readable, composable from culturally understood business logic. In some ways, not unlike the original record volume, where you could scan and use it without any fancy search technology. Instead, consuming registers would separately store their metadata and provide search tools to map that metadata to keys. On the service design side, it was recognized it would be much easier to adopt if it wasn't just a technology stack, but if it included the operational monitoring and the backup and all of the governance processes, and then offered them as a complete service to other teams. So how do we get on? Well, in late March 2020, not unlike many organizations, ROS had to close its premises due to COVID-19. And so for legal reasons, pre-COVID, most applications required a physical signature and therefore a paper submission you can see. So when Ron's premises were closed in late March, work was urgently undertaken with the support of new legislation to allow for digital submissions of applications. And within two weeks, Ross was accepting advanced notifications of transactions, within six weeks, the complete regis land register, and within 12 weeks, Sazians and further registers for applications. Each digital submission contained deeds and other artifacts that are now sent to the appropriate collection in the cloud automatically when the application is complete. Previously, this required physically scanning and manually indexing and then uploading to the historic archive devices. There are now a wide variety of registers using this single archive capability, with new archive collections able to be developed, approved by governance, and deployed within two weeks. At the beginning of the presentation, I mentioned that historic Sazing deeds are essential to understand the full history of the property. Perhaps your grandparents decided to sell the cottage to you, hopefully for a keen price. That sale would require the property to be transferred to the land register from the Sazians. This is a complicated and highly skilled process that requires understanding the historical legal deeds and then transcribing the relevant sections of the image of the deed to the flattened textual representation of the land register. One unforeseen benefit occurred through this is that when Ross recently trialed AWS Textract, the, architect, the archive added the get endpoint uh, and was enhanced for it. And so using this unique deed key that we've been speaking about, one can now request any object, either as the standard image or now as text transcribed by Textract. This saves the registration officer substantial time typing. It frees them up for more valuable work and it accelerates the overall registration process. Having all these documents stored on a common platform allows for additional services to be layered on easily and add value to the existing processes as well as being able to use Amazon TextTrack to automate the conversion of images to text. There was also the additional benefit of being able to simply add in Lambda to easily remove any irrelevant metadata, for example, page numbers. These processes always existed, but the glue to making it work was very labor intensive and a manual process. So going back to our mortgage uh, that's just been discharged on, on our property in Loch Lomond, the document's been uploaded as a PDF and saved into the S3 document collection. Again, S3 event triggers the Lambda initiating the text track conversion process. This results in the text file being created in the same location as the original deed. And as Keith explained, we now have a machine readable version of the deed, which facilitates improved indexing and search capabilities within the land register. There are currently millions of unprocessed deed images, which are planned to be bulk converted using S3 batch operations, essentially combining converting the images to PDF and converting them to the text version via Textract. 
And as the TypeScript AI learns and increases its accuracy over time, so there's also the opportunity to regenerate these text files, providing a more accurate analysis of the process deed document. We have requested that the TextStrike team can add the functionality of interpreting Scottish legal Latin from the 16-1700s, but we're not having much luck with that. They seem to say it's a bit too niche. In summary, we've discussed how ROS has migrated its critical deed images to the serverless cloud through three lenses. First, technically, how ROS achieved higher durability and security for its invaluable land deeds. Second, operationally, how ROS leveraged additional AWS services to improve its capabilities in deployment, monitoring, and backup. And third, organizationally, how ROS encouraged the adoption by keeping the architecture simple and providing a complete service to other teams. So finally, Charlie and I would like to share a few takeaways that we've learned through this process. The first two are from me and the second set from Charlie. So first, ROS adopted CDK early when it was still quite a new technology. There were some teething problems and particularly around cross-account deployment. And these have now been resolved due to the introduction of a new feature called CDK pipelines. There's too many benefits though to list about CDK. So three standout ones for me make sense to talk about. A, CDK's ability to generate rules at deployment time radically improves practical security. You no longer need to worry about reused rules or the permission creep that comes along with them. B, CDK allows for a single language, front end, back end, and infrastructure. And this clearly reduces cognitive overheads and it widens the scope particularly for, partici for participation with junior members of a team. And C, CDK is infrastructure as real code. With CDK, you can express your infrastructure in a standard language with an intent-based API and avoid needing to get into the details of various configuration-oriented DSLs. As a second takeaway, take my view, perhaps uh, the biggest impact on adoption was the commitment of the team to consider the archive as a complete service to the organization. It wasn't just a cloud formation stack that could be reused nor was it seen as an API with a backend service to maintain. Instead, it was a complete offering, a simple reusable domain model with built-in durability, security, scaling, monitoring, backup, and all of the other governance processes needed for other teams to be able to quickly make use of it, both technically, but also organizationally. So on point three, it's great to walk into the first ROS meeting and hear, we want to target serverless rather than containers or EC2. From the very start, ROS management teams set their bar high, and they've driven this using a forward-thinking strategy. It's refreshing to see this ambition being taken in public sector, with the teams now reaping the rewards and realizing their planned and some unplanned benefits. At AWS, we adopt a working backwards approach, identifying the key business outcomes and actions that will change the way the business operates in a positive manner. We work back from there to identify a technical solution whilst also tackling potential issues to adoption before they become a real blocker. Luckily, ROS had already adopted this approach and identified key candidates that, of the applications that they wanted to migrate. This was highlighted earlier when we talked about the document archive service opening up the adoption by many other services. ROS didn't know TechStrike was going to be a thing but the ability to consume as an abstracted service made it very simple for them to test whether it was going to add value to their current processes. So they tried it out and the rest is history, literally. Very early on, we carried out a well-architected review on the ROS platform. This set an early baseline for their maturity against the well-architected pillars, which are security, reliability, operational excellence, performance efficiency, and cost optimization. Understanding that not all the controls needed to be in place immediately allowed us to create milestones on the route to production. This was all done in a risk-based approach and allowed agility in the delivery, the delivery by iterating forwards based on the platform maturity. When the well-architected serverless lens was released, the product teams instantly uh, started using this to help moving their service implementations towards best practice. I've got a slide here, there's some great links on here. The Well-Architected Framework link, it gives you an overview of the five pillars, information about the Well-Architected tool, 
and the different well-architected lenses. The well-architected labs, the place you can get your hands dirty with some practical hands-on experience. The architecture and solutions library are a great resource for finding some vetted patterns that you can apply to your organisation and help move forward towards well-architected best practices. So all of this work has been a team effort. I'd like to thank Keith for co-presenting with me, but I have to give a shout out to the product and platform teams for doing all the hard work and getting this and other projects over the line. And finally, thank you for taking the time to attend our session. Keith and I hope you found it useful.